Hello and welcome to chapel today. We're going to enjoy some old hymns and some scripture and I want to begin by reading uh, something about our coming together to sing. This was written by Ralph Carmichael who is a uh, contemporary uh, musician and uh, hymn writer. The church has always sung, whether on the high mountain of victory and celebration or through the low valley of persecution and despair. Still the church has sung with great fervor. So let the church sing on. So let's like sing on today. I, I like that too. <laughs> um, will you uh, bow with me and uh, join in the uh, Lord's Prayer? Let us pray. Our Father, Father who art Lord in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our first hymn today is from um, is Holy, 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 and I want to read with you. Are you sing Amazing Grace. Oh, you? we're going to sing Amazing Grace first. Yes, thank you, Bill. Right. See, okay. yes, let's sing Amazing Grace. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Amazing Grace. still coming in so we're kind of giving them a hint as to where they can find the the songbooks for today um, and so now we're going to sing amazing grace the second time first verse and then we'll sing the last verse when we've been there 10,000 yes. years sing-along in an assisted living and uh, memory care community here at Lakewood Village in Fort Worth where we live and we always begin with Amazing Grace and in the memory care um, we only sing the first verse and then I encourage them to sing the last verse and I always start out by saying when we've been there how long and they all remember 10,000 years so it's always great to sing Amazing Grace. In uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 15, verse 2, we read these words. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mixed with fire. And those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name stood standing by, beside the sea of glass with harps of gold in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. Great and amazing are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Lord, who will not fear and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your judgments have been revealed. Let's sing, Holy, Holy, Holy. <laughs> Thank you. 
another familiar verse is our verses are found in the sixth chapter of Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up. And the hem of his robe filled the temple. And seraphims were in attendance above him, and each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Let's sing Holy, Holy, Holy one more time. Holy, 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 Lord God a foundation, another one of my favorites, but I really do like this hymn a lot. Uh, and we really don't know who wrote this hymn. There are several guesses and thoughts about who did that, but it, that's, it's interesting because most of our hymns, we know who wrote them, but this is one of those interesting hymns that uh, does not uh, tell us for sure who wrote it. Uh, let me read this scripture for you. Deuteronomy 31, 6 and 8. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them, for the Lord your God, He it is that goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. He it is that goes before you. He will be with you. He will not fail you, neither will He forsake you. Fear not, neither be dismayed. Oh, aren't those great words for us? Let's sing the first verse, and then I'll share a little bit more of the Scripture with you. From a foundation you sing so the Lord is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say unto you? He has said to you after Jesus to refuge for fled. Oh, that's a little bit different there. No, that's not the original word. That, that someone has put here, but um, uh, I'm used to singing to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. Yeah, so, yeah that's yeah, but <laughs> that's this is written a little bit say. differently. Yeah. All right, let me read a few verses and then I'll share with you the words from some of the other verses so that you can see how clearly they tie to the scripture. Isaiah 41 10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. In Isaiah 43, it, we read, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor, nor shall the flames scorch you. And in 2 Corinthians 12, we read, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And then in Hebrews we read, For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, thinking about those words, listen to these verses. Um, Fear not, I am with thee. Oh, be not dismayed. For I am your God and will still give you aid. I'll strengthen you, help you, and cause you to stand upheld by my righteous omnipotent hand. When through the deep waters I call you to go, the rivers of sorrow shall not overflow. For I will be with you your troubles to bless and sanctify to you your deepest distress. When through fiery trials your pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be your supply. The flame shall not hurt you. I only design 
your dross to consume and your gold to refine. And then the last verse says, The soul that on Jesus has leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Can't you just hear the words of the scripture in those verses? Let's sing that verse again. How firm the foundation you saints of the Lord is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can you say and you he has said to run to the Savior to also talks about foundation and this one says the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ her Lord. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 11 for no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid and that foundation is Jesus Christ. Let's sing the first verse and then I'll share another little bit of scripture and information with you. The church is one foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord. She is His creation with waters from the world. From Him He came and sought her to be His holy bride with His own body church in the New Testament is called the Bride of Christ and so we are his bride for whom he died. In Ephesians chapter 2 we read these words, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place <coughs> for God. The author of this hymn, Samuel Johnson Stone, uh, who wrote it in 1866, wrote this hymn as one of 12 hymns based on what there are called the Twelve Articles of the Apostles' Creed, which is a way of summarizing uh, in a fairly short, uh, easy to remember statement. It summarizes what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. And it goes on to name the basic tenets of the Christian faith. Well, he wrote this. There are 12 apparent, I guess there's 12. This says there are 12. I've never actually counted the lines or tenets or or basic beliefs that are included in the Apostles' Creed. And he wrote these 12 hymns to help people better understand the creed that they often recited but seldom understood. There are a couple of things in the creed, the original version that we use most often. One thing it says is that uh, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, and many people struggle with that word, but it's a small C, not a capital C. The small letter C, Catholic, means universal. If you look it up in the dictionary, that's what it means. It means universal. So I believe in the worldwide universal church of Jesus Christ. And then there's another place in there that we often uh, don't realize what it says, and I believe uh, he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. And quick, you know, the fast and the dead slow or what? The quick, when we uh, break a fingernail, sometimes we break it down to the quick. It means the living, the living. So he shall come to judge the living and the dead. So sometimes we say words in a creed, but we also sing words in hymns, and we don't think about what they mean. So I think it's really important, and that's why we talk about our hymns. What do they mean? And that's uh, something that I think is really important. Aren't you glad we don't sing all 12 verses in, or 12 hymns? Yeah, 12 verses in a hymn is, is a lot, but 12 songs about one creed, that's really a lot. Let's sing that verse again. The church is one foundation, is Jesus 
Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus the creation was born of From her became and sought to be a holy bride. And his own blood and water and for her life I grew up in a, a church that did not use creeds. We did not recite creeds. And so when I married into a church that uses creeds, I had to kind of figure out my way of understanding the creeds. But one of the things I struggled with until I understood the word was the Holy Catholic Church. It, I had to learn. It doesn't mean Roman Catholic. It means universal. But I, I, it's a hard thing when you have not used creeds before. Uh, to to learn to say them and to realize that they they do in many ways capture what we believe in a very short way of putting it. It's almost like a statement of faith that, that denominations will have, churches will have, a statement of what we believe. All right, our next hymn is Where He Leads Me, I Will Follow. Don't we wish that were always true? Sometimes we don't want to go where he leads, do we? This song was written by Ernest Blandy in 1890, and he was a Salvation Army officer. And he wrote this song, and I'll read you a little bit about it in a few moments. Mark 8:34 says, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Let's sing it the first verse, and then I'll share with you the story about this here. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take my cross and follow, follow me. except that he evidently had a very strong faith and he lived out his faith in ministry in a slum neighborhood. Uh, he was given the uh, uh, choice of where he would go to serve with the Salvation Army at a, a what was called a, or described as a decent church in a decent place or in Hell's Kitchen, a slum area in New York. And he chose Hell's Kitchen in 1890. He apparently felt, according to the words of this hymn, um, where he leads me, that the Lord was directing him there. Hell's Kitchen was overcrowded and inhabited by crime gangs, so law-breaking was a way of life for many of its residents. Step on others or be stepped on yourself. An earnest musical response to what he saw in Hell's Kitchen was not terribly involved. This is a very simple song. It repeats that phrase, where he leads me, I will follow, many times. And that's where the inspiration for that hymn came from. Let's sing that verse one more time. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Cross and follow, follow me. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him. First thing that I, I read from Ralph Carmichael, 
The church has always sung, whether on the high mountains of victory and celebration or through the low valley of persecution and despair, still the church has sung with great fervor. And sometimes he leads us to the high mountains of victory and celebration. And sometimes it's a low valley of persecution and despair. And I suspect that Mr. Blandy often felt uh, persecuted because you know those gangs were not very nice to him. And I'm sure he felt some despair at the, at the poverty uh, of the people that he was trying to serve. So uh, that's interesting, isn't it, that the Lord led us to these words from Ralph Carmichael today. Our next hymn is Rescue the Perishing by one of our favorite hymn writers, Fanny Crosby. She wrote it in 1869. Let's sing the first verse and then I'll share with you the scriptures. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, she stood at the door of the mission and greeted all of the homeless people who came in and these this is what inspired her you know to write this hymn is seeing the people who were perishing who have gone astray uh, who needed to be gathered in in James 5 we read my brothers and sisters if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back from another you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. And in Jude, or Judah, as I am told the, the uh, Hebrew would, would call it, and have mercy on some who are wavering. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. And what did the verse say? Snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. Jude wrote, have mercy on those who are wavering save others by snatching them out of the fire and have mercy on still others with fear having hating even the tunic defiled by their bodies but loving the person loving the person always loving the person let's sing rescue the perishing again reminded us of the words of um, the Apostle Peter when he talked about um, be prepared to give an answer to those who ask you about the hope that is within you and he shared some of the newer translations and talked about some of them say um, be prepared to give them an answer give them your answer with respect and humility not shouting and angry words but with respect and humility because that's the best way to rescue them, isn't it? They're not likely to listen to too much if we're shouting and angry. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, another of Fanny Crosby's hymns, which she wrote in 1868. Um, let, uh, I'll tell you about the music, and then we'll read the scripture after the first verse. So the music, Fanny Crosby wrote the words, but the music was written by William Doan in 1870. She wrote the words in 1868. While visiting who, uh, someone who was a friend and he was director of another mission. Honestly, I did not realize that I was going to be talking about missions so much today. When I looked through what I was reading, I did it rather quickly just to remind myself of what paragraphs I wanted to use. And it didn't occur to me, I didn't catch the fact that we have three hymns that all deal with a mission. He was asked to write a hymn celebration of the upcoming anniversary of this Five Points Rescue Mission in New York. And he agreed to write the music but asked who would write the words and in his hotel room that evening he prayed about that very question. 
there came a knock at the door and there stood a messenger bearing a note from Fanny Crosby. And the note read, Mr. Doan, I have never met you, but I feel compelled to send you this hymn, Let My Savior. The hymn began, uh, More like Jesus would I be, let my Savior dwell with me. And he wrote that music that night, and it was used as an anniversary hymn. So he and Fanny Crosby teamed up on more than one song. Yeah. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Let's sing the first verse, and then I'll read the scripture for us. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While another star are calling, do not pass me by. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. In Luke chapter 18, we read these words. This is a familiar story. As he approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard a crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And then he shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he shouted even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, let me see again. And Jesus said to him, Receive your sight, your faith has saved you. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, praised God. Let's sing this one more time. the hymn, I remembered someone else that Jesus stopped. This man wanted to see Jesus. He was not blind. And he wanted to see Jesus so badly that he climbed up a tree. Remember that story? Who was Zacchaeus. that? Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, yes. Remember the song that many of you probably sang when you were a little child? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the Trichamore Sea, the Savior for to see. And when the Savior passed that way, he looked right up and said, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house today. <laughs> Oh you remember goodness. the word. I, remember, I, remember I couldn't that. believe that. I, I, that I remember, remember the word because I hadn't even thought about it until we were singing. <laughs> but Jesus always stops, doesn't he? He always stops for us. Well, the next one also talks about Jesus is calling us. This one was softly and tenderly, and then we uh, or no, it was pass me by. And this one is softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. We need to listen, don't we? Um, like Zacchaeus did when Jesus said to him, come down. He could have just stayed up in the tree, but he didn't. He came down. Um, Matthew 11, 28 and 29, these very familiar verses. Come to me, all you that are weary and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's sing softly and tenderly. Jesus is calling. Come it might unto be me. interesting for them to know that a friend of mine, Cynthia Clawson, sang this 
and the opening of Trip to Bountiful, the movie. Oh, yes. She sang this over the credits at the opening oh, of the movie. Oh, how about that? It's That's interesting how listen. many hymns we find in movies, yeah. yeah. Let's <laughs> sing softly and tenderly. And did you notice that my friend, Cynthia Clawson? Just, yes. Well, she She's is. a wonderful <laughs> music. I know, I'm just giving you a hard time. She's a wonderful <laughs> Christian musician. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. Sing on the portals, He's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Will Thompson in 1880. It's often used as an uh, invitation hymn at the end of a worship service. He actually uh, achieved great success as a musician and uh, published his songs on his own. He actually paid for them to be published. He wrote secular as well as sacred songs and was very well known for some of his secular songs. If you're from Ohio, you may know this hymn, Home on the Old Ohio. And then he also wrote a hymn that was very popular in that day called Gathering Shells from the Sea. Now, I don't know those, but maybe they're not popular now, but yeah. they were back then. He was so successful that he actually became a millionaire. Very interesting. But then he wanted to express his gratitude to God, and so he began to do that more and more through his hymns and dedicated the money that he used, uh, that he made to uh, helping to support him in order to write uh, Christian hymns for him. In 18, in the late 1890s, because he wrote this, what did I say, in 1890? 47. Mm. I can't remember now. Anyway, um, in the late 1890s, evangelist Dwight L. Moody, who, who was a very famous evangelist of his day, uh, was dying, and Will Thompson went to visit him, and the doctors was, was saying, no visitors. But as Will was outside the, the bedroom door and the doctor was explaining this, our friends were explaining this, Mr. Moody recognized Will Thompson's voice and insisted that he be brought in. And he said to Will Thompson, Will, I would rather have written softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, than anything I've been able to do in my whole life. That's an amazing statement from an evangelist who traveled all over and led countless thousands of people to Christ. So let's sing that one more time. We've only sung it once, right? Okay. Softly and tenderly Jesus is calling Calling for you and for me Sing on the portals He's waiting and watching Watching for you and for We sometimes wander away, don't we? And we need to come home over and over again. Um, in the uh, in earlier years, they used to call it backsliding. You know, yeah. sometimes we backslide, <laughs> and we need to come back home to Christ, don't we? Uh, our next hymn is "Precious Name." I bet you can guess what that precious name is. Yeah. Psalm seventy-two said, "Blessed, but blessed be His glorious name forever." <laughs> And Nehemiah chapter 9 says, Blessed be your glorious name. And then we'll talk about it a little more after we sing it once. Take the name of Jesus with you To every sorrow and the It will joy and comfort give you Take 
All of our hymns have been quite old today. 1870 by Lydia Baxter, and she was uh, an invalid for most of her life. And um, she was bedridden, and she offered advice and inspiration for many um, um, Christians who would come and visit her, including preachers and evangelists and full-time Christian workers. They would come to visit her thinking they were coming to give comfort to her, and she ended up giving comfort to them. Uh, and her friends used to say that a visit to her sick room was not so much to give her encouragement and comfort as to receive some buoyancy for their own spirits. Her explanation was, I have a very special armor. I have the name of Jesus. When the tempter tries to make me blue or despondent, I mention the name of Jesus, and he, the tempter, cannot get through to me anymore. The name of Jesus means Savior, and it comes from the same Hebrew root from the names of Joshua and Joash. These stanzas talk about the name of Jesus, and there is no more precious name. Let's sing that again. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of joy. It will joy and comfort give. Then where will you go? Precious name, oh sweet, of oh, earth and joy of man. Precious name, oh sweet, of oh, earth and joy of I think in one of our times together, we sing some songs that are all about the name of Jesus. I think we have a, kind of a, a grouping of, of yes. songs, and so we'll get to that one of these days. Our last hymn for today is There is Power in the Blood. Unfortunately, one that we don't sing very much today. But I share with you the scripture from Revelation 7, 14. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, You know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. Let's sing the first verse, and then I'll share uh, a let's, little bit more. Linda, let's sing it a little slower than we used okay, to do. Okay, yeah, let's do would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would your evil of the victim begin? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is John chapter 1 we read this is the message that we have heard from him and that we proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all if we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness we lie and do not do what is true but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Isn't that a great and glorious yeah. promise? Let's uh, sing that one more time. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you are evil of the
what a great way to end, remembering that Christ is our uh, Lamb of God. John the baptizer said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We come now to the time when we read or recite together the 23rd Psalm. So let's do that together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Another one of those great and glorious promises. Well, let's uh, be uh, uh, receive the benediction. Sorry, that just didn't want to come out right, did it? Let's receive the benediction, and then we'll join together in singing God be with you till we meet again. May the glory be to God, who alone is wise. May the glory be to Him through Jesus Christ forever. That's found in the 16th chapter of Romans. Let's sing, May God be with you till we meet again. God right, be with I'll you. The right one in All right. Here we go. God, God be with you till we meet again. By His counsels I have woven with the sheep securely fold you. God be with you to me again. Till we meet, 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 God be with you till we meet again. God be with you.